Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Book Talk. I am delighted today to have the opportunity to introduce you to my good friend and amazing author, Christy Cambron, who many of you may know from her World War II novels, but she also is writing more of kind of a dual timeline, um, Italian ballerina, the Paris dressmaker, and then she's got one that she's working on right now set in England. So Christy, do you want to take a moment and introduce yourself? I do. Hi. I, I got excited when we jumped on here and I immediately started waving. Hi, everyone. <laughs> because you all don't know this, but Kara and I were chatting before we got in the video and it has been so long since we've just seen each other's face that it was so much fun to catch up. And, you know, you feel like you just um, took about 10 cups of coffee <laughs> and you see the face of someone who's been such a good friend for so many years and you finally get a chance to connect. So I am thrilled to be here. That was a beautiful intro. So yes, right now I write World War II, but my books are really set in the 20th century. So I have some split time novels. I actually have one that goes back to the French Revolution. So that one's kind of an outlier, The Lost Castle. But yes, most of my books center around the concept of beauty in this juxtaposition right next to pain or right next to war. And so I really like to show the light and the dark contrast and where the light outshines any of the darkness being the war. And so you'll find fine arts in my books. I have an art history degree. So I I went to school at IU for that, specifically for art. And I love to bring any type of art, whether it's visual art or music, like in The Butterfly and the Violin, if you've read that book. Uh, my new book actually is about literature. So it's the one that I'm writing right now is set in bookshops in Coventry, England. And so I get to put in my love of books and literature in that. And I've never set a story in bookshops before. So I'm always trying to do something new, Kara. I know you do that too with your novels. I always try to do something new and every novel but that's really what you'll get typically a split time story that is big on heart and has beauty right next to darkness and likes to show how the light overcomes that darkness that's a little bit about me and it's so true because that showed up from your very first book which you wrote on your iphone um, I did. <laughs> butterfly <laughs> and the violin and I, it, it, you just do that you bring this merging together of these settings and you know, World War II, but these others are the crumbling castles and bringing back to life. Um, how did you get drawn to that as like the theme? Because it is what laces all of your books together. Yeah, I mean, it is the connection with art and art history. It's one of the things that I loved, and, and I'm going to nerd out on everybody <laughs> for just a second, but I loved that you could step into a museum and you could see a piece of art whether it's a painting or whether it's a sculpture, you could see something and it's that human expression. And there's so many layers to this. It's multifaceted. It's not just looking at a pretty painting and appreciating that. It's literally looking at someone's heart, someone's expression of their humanity and what was happening at their time and place and experience in the world. And so I've always loved that. I've always loved the stories behind the stories. And so for me, there's a, there's a way to do that when you're writing fiction. You have a story and you're telling something based on, let's say it's World War II, you've got some historical fact, but what are the, the human experiences and the expression that's behind that? It's a story within a story. And so those are the things that I love to tell in my books. And so the, the most recent one, The Italian Ballerina, as an example, um, love this story, Kara. Um, when people say, well, how'd you come up with the idea for this book or that book? You, I'm sure you get that a lot. And they'll say, well, where'd you come up with this idea? This I have loved to tell people came from a reader. And I don't Ooh. even remember the reader who sent it to me. If it's you, hi, thank you. I love you. <laughs> um, but a reader sent me this article years and years ago. And I just filed it away, just saved the idea and said, I always knew I wanted to write a ballerina story because again, that grace and that beauty, I just, oh, right next to war, I thought, oh, wow, that, there's so much that beauty can overcome. But this reader sent me this story that was a true story about a hospital on Tiber Island in Rome. And I hope I'm saying this correctly, because Kara, you've probably been there. Fetta Benny Fratelli, yeah. Fetta Benny Fratelli Hospital mm -hmm. on Tiber Island. And yep. where they actually, when we had the occupation of Rome in October of 1940, and so you've, you've got the the Nazis that came in and just occupied the city. And actually it was later than that. I'm getting my dates crossed, but you can look at the back cover copy on the book and you can get the exact dates. 
But all that to say, when the Nazi occupation came in, the staff at the hospital came up with this idea that they would invent a plague, a fake plague called Syndrome K. And it was all to fool the Nazis. And it worked. I mean, you can't even write something like this. Like the, the real world, sometimes it, it reads like fiction. And I love that story that they saved countless numbers of Jews, hundreds of Jews from that hospital by saying that they had a fake plague and the Nazis avoided this quarantined area of the hospital, so to speak, and they saved lives outside of it. And so for me, I just thought, wow, the heroism, uh, the courage, the bravery of the doctors and, and the, the religious leaders at the church that was adjoined to the hospital, all of that for humanity to save lives. And I just thought it was the most incredible story. And I said, I want to write that one day. So it's, it's usually like a niche topic that kind of hits right here in the heart. And then all of a sudden you're saying, oh, I want to write that, right? I, I want to write that. And it was actually 1943. I looked at the back of the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's got to remember. It was everyone's got to remember as authors, we researched this and wrote this a few years ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm already I'm already moved on to writing my next novel right now. I'm on deadline. And so I've got all of those dates, 1940, like right here in my head. They're right here. Well, and it was like, well, I know it's before June 1944 because uh Rome was liberated on the same day as D-Day. And yes. so yes. I have a yeah. scene in that in my Shadow Bay Grace because they were all like typing away at the AP office and they went, uh, no one's ever going to read our stories because D-Day just happened. Because D-Day so, just happened. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's funny how those those little events will they'll they'll capture your imagination. And then the next thing you know, you're often writing a book around that. Because when I was reading the Italian ballerina, I loved that whole idea of syndrome K. And I was like, that represents the spirit that we often forget. Um, when I was in Berlin in 2022, one of the things I did is I went to the Resistors Museum because we often think wow. like, everybody was in support of Hitler and that's not true, but it's so right. easy to kind of get sucked into that and lose mm. sight of all the really amazing people who stood up and many lost their lives and they were coming yes. from all these different populations. And so that Italian ballerina book really highlights another way that was happening in another place that people knew it wasn't right. And so they came up with really incredible ways that most of us be like, that never work. That we're going to all die. That's insane. And yet they saved hundreds of people. And it's, it really captures so much of the American or not the American, the human spirit and right. the way that we will just when pressed to the wall, stand for what's right in those really hard circumstances. And so now you've turned to another story that's right. equally unknown because most people, when we hear the Blitz, we think London, not London. realizing mm -hmm. that places like Coventry were literally wiped off the map um, and had to come back from almost nothing. So right. how did you decide that that was gonna be the setting for this next book that's coming? Well, it's really kind of a heartbreaking aspect to it. You know, you mentioned that Coventry was hit so hard. And in November of 1940, the raids that occurred on November 14th and 15th are actually the single biggest loss of life for England, uh, the civilian loss of life for England during the war. Wow. And so London was hit so hard and London appeared in the news, but all of these outlying areas, they were really kind of quieted in the news, so to speak. And it was because of needing to bolster that spirit literally for five going on six years to yeah. ensure that England and the allies could win this war. And so they they really, for the purposes, many different purposes, but mainly for morale, for, for country that stiff upper lip, you know, that keep calm and carry on. So you really didn't get a lot of that news footage. But then also in the years, decades after the war, you may have heard of this or read of this, but there is speculation. How much did Churchill and his cabinet know about the raid that came and hit Coventry? Was it known ahead of time? And could they not say anything? Because that would tell the Nazis that mm. the Enigma code had just yeah. been broken. You know what I mean? And so there's all this speculation. And the book is not about the speculation. The book is 
is really about, again, that survival, that human spirit. And so there are a few things that I wanted to write. When I read that heartbreaking stat about what happened with Coventry, I started digging into it. And it's such a beautiful city. It's really a, a, just a hub of medieval architecture and history and the arts. And then you've got the, the pastoral areas surrounding Coventry. It was such a beautiful area that I thought I really wanted to focus on that. And one of the other things I'm writing about, yes, I'm focusing on two bookshops that are across the street from one, one another in Coventry City, but I'm also writing about some pastoral areas and the Land Girls. Has anyone out there heard of the Land Girls? I, I was just <laughs> fascinated by this, right? Like there's a there's a BBC series, I believe you can watch on Amazon Prime or sometimes it's on you know Netflix, the Land Girls. I haven't watched it yet because I didn't want it to influence my book writing in any way. So I'll watch it as soon as I turn my book in. But I wanted to write about the Land Girls, these girls who would come just this beautiful spirit of wanting to help king and country. And they would come from these metropolitan areas and they would go to some of the most rugged outlying areas of Scotland and England, and they would work the farms and they would generate food production. They didn't just grow food. I mean, they would do milk runs. They would do dairy farming. They did timber work. Really, this is, this is going to be kind of shocking. And I felt really bad for the girls who stepped up to do this, but they also had rat catchers. They were rat catchers in Ooh. the women's land army. Yes. So all of these things that I'm learning about these women who were so strong and so smart and so driven to serve their country. And they did it within the borders of England and the food production during those years. And so I thought you have these girls who are metropolitan, they are plucked out of everything they know and sent to the country. And then it's, it's kind of, it's a war, right? So nothing's yeah. really safe, but you would think on a farm in Coventry and probably not gonna see very much action. And then all of a sudden, they're smack dab in the middle of a war zone. And one of the most devastating raids that England saw during the entire war. And so, yeah, so I wanted to, again, have the beauty that can come even out of those dark circumstances. And so that is what I'm writing right now. It doesn't have a title yet, um, but I will be writing it for the next many months. Well, and those of you who are listening and watching, you can tell Christy brings a passion for the history to this. And the book I just turned <laughs> in has World War II art and overtures and all of that. And it's so much fun. There's so much research that you want to slip it all in. And yet you can't right. because otherwise it would read like a historical tome that's heavy and dense and it's not a story. So right. what's one thing that you read that absolutely fascinated you and you're like I can't put that in the book <laughs> well I'm gonna I'm gonna actually show something on camera yeah. I'm gonna lean back and I'm gonna show you can you see all these books right here yeah. all of these books are just some of the research books for the novel that I'm writing now but I have to tell you again nerding out in front of all of you yeah. but I feel like I'm in I feel like I'm with friends so I can say this um I literally sat down and read the land girl manual from 1941 cover to cover and it has photographs and it has the uniforms I mean like I am going in detail over the uniforms so you can't put all that in because it's a research report you know like yeah. I'm not not a journalist I'm a novelist and so I have to make sure that I'm finding a way to take all of this super nerdy research which I love is probably my favorite part of the process because I'm very curious I like to learn things um, I have not ruled out going to a dairy farm and asking them if they will please put me to work so and I usually <laughs> do that with my books um, pre-COVID and now hopefully you know if we're if we're moving towards a post-COVID world hopefully um, I will be able to get out and do more hands on research, but I love that kind of thing. You know, yeah. I, I had a storyline in the painted castle that was a beekeeping storyline. And so I went to a working honey farm and I actually lifted one of the frames and had the net and had the bees all over me. And, and then I was researching something else about tuberculosis um, in the early 20th century. And so I went to a former TB hospital and I went to the morgue and I walked through the body shoot and just all of that. So I love the hands-on research. So if I can, if if I can go to a dairy farm, I'm actually planning on doing that. I'm super nervous about it, but it could be really fun. Um, but yeah, I will usually tell people if it's safe and it's legal, put me yeah. to work uh, and I will do whatever I can do to learn for the purposes of research. So we'll see. We'll see what'll make it in the book. 
Well, the next book I'm writing is going to have like the Russian mob in it, and I'm not going to volunteer to go work for the Russian don't mob. Don't do, don't do that. No, yeah. no, I, I, I would, would recommend it. like the whole legal <laughs> thing. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Is it, is that legal? Is that safe? Kara, I don't know. Not I don't know. Not, probably not. <laughs> Might not be. But it's funny because I'm at my work office, but in my home office, I had a shelf of books for this last novel that I just turned in where it right. was all about art in World War II. And then I've got another shelf that's all about forgery and fraud because that's going to be this next one. And then, right. you know, it's like every book, there's a shelf and you hang on to them because you never know when you're going to need it. And right. when you might have another. I idea. rotate. I rotate yes, these exactly. out. Yeah. The cart, when you're writing a new novel, you get all new span yes. of books on the cart. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's so much fun. But in addition to writing these amazing, award-winning, highly recognized books, you also are now an agent. So how do you, now I'm not going to say fall into that because it's clearly, it's such a calling and you have, get such joy from it. But how did you decide to pivot into adding agenting to your writing? Oh, I love that question. Um, and it's a fun story because um, so many people might not know this about me, but I spent 15 years in corporate America before I became an author. So I worked for a Fortune 100 company. I did training classes. I was jet setting all over the place. And, and that's really when I started writing my first novels was in airports and in conference rooms waiting for meetings to begin. Um, there would be times I'd be in the elevator and we're going up the skyscraper and I would be in the back on my phone typing dialogue, you know, on the notes app on my phone. And so I had this business side of me, this business experience that I really did enjoy. It wasn't my calling on my heart. My calling is to writing. Um, so I always wanted to step out of that and move over here to writing. But I will say that I, I really enjoyed the business side of things. And so I'm represented by Rochelle Gardner of Gardner Literary. And um, this this came about when we were actually in Nashville at a writing conference and we were just having dinner and we were chatting about business and books and publishing and she knew where my heart was for helping people and working with aspiring authors it's it's something that has always been a, just a part of my heart and she said I would love for you to consider being an agent with my agency and I was shocked I really was I wanted to say yes right away but I tried to be smart and say can I please speak with my husband and we yeah. spoke and you know it was like a formality really it yeah. was like a you that kind of thing because I knew I was going to say yes and then did say yes and I love it I love the aspect of getting to work with especially aspiring authors but I have some experienced clients as well and there are a few things if I love your work I just love your writing. I love your voice. And I want to step in and help you share that work and share that voice with readers out there. And so, yeah, so I'm working with clients in fiction and nonfiction in the Christian market and some in general market as well. Um, so if anyone is interested, if you're an aspiring author and you're watching this and you may want to work with us at Gardner Literary, because Kara, you're also represented yeah. by Gardner Literary now as yeah, well, right? Great. You're the same yeah. agent. Yeah. So yeah. if anyone's interested, you can go to gardner-literary.com and you can see what we're looking for, the authors that we represent. Um, you can see what I specifically am looking for because I do have a wish list of things that I am looking for to come in my inbox. And uh, so, yeah, so I'm loving it. And I'm, I'm just enjoying the opportunity, as I said, to work with authors, especially the aspiring authors and the new authors. All the things that I've learned in the last decade in publishing I would love to then take that, that other people have been so kind and shared with me and, and pass that on and share it with other authors. So it's really cool. You actually step on the wings of the stage and you see your author out there and the spotlight is shining on them. And then in the Christian market, it, it, then they are shining that spotlight on Christ. And so I, that, that's the way that I view it as an agent, a booster, an encourager, a support for the spotlight to be turned uh, two times. Yeah, I love that. And it's such a part of who you are. You're just, you're an encourager. You're a mentor. Um, you're someone who just pours life and energy into other people. So it's such a natural for you to move into this space and kind of have that combination of your exceptional writing and your experience there, but also then pulling in your business experience. It's just, it's a no brainer. So it's fun to see you step into that and have it just really thrive for you. So what's yeah. on your wish list? 
Oh, well, okay. So as I said, you can go to the website and you can see everything that's on the list, but a few things that I'm excited about right now. So when the holidays came around, I'd never done this before, but I started reading Christmas books. I know everybody does it and it's not like it's a new thing, but for some reason I wanted light, light stories, happy stories, uplifting, encouraging. And so all of a sudden I started reading rom-coms and I'm over here, the historical fiction girl. And I was attracted <laughs> to rom-coms. So give me a really fun rom-com with some really good banter, maybe set in some office settings. Um, I would love something that's set maybe in London or New York or LA somewhere, somewhere that I haven't spent a lot of time. Uh, and give me some some really good rom coms. I would love to see that. I one thing that I'm always on the lookout for are fairy tale retellings. I'm just I'm just a sucker for those. You can just pull me right in <laughs> with your unique fairy tale retelling. So um, if you are an aspiring, especially young adult author, I really need you to have a larger platform specifically for that space um, and a unique idea if it's a fairy tale retelling. Um, and Kara, and then something that I just always love, I love steampunk. Just really <laughs> do. I just I'm like who would have thought but I just really love steampunk um for fiction and so if you have anything that's got that whole like uh, Victorian vibe and it's got like the whole industrialization vibe but you've got like some kind of art to match with it anything that's in this space of art meets history meets faith or meets creativity anything that's in that space i'm really looking for it um even memoirs like world war ii memoirs if you if you have one of those oh i would definitely be interested in that so my tastes are changing over the years still yeah. looking for historical fiction um but primarily interested in niche topics strong women so niche topics really strong mm -hmm. women especially women if you can find women in history whose voices haven't been out there i would love i would love to work with you um and and bring those voices out to readers so yeah those are things i'm looking for also think um stories set in europe but they don't have to be london or paris or rome um stories that are in other places of europe especially historical fiction looking for that as well so that's, that's my wish point. list. That's what I'm, and I, and I can share what I'm reading right now if you want me to. Oh, Is that sure. something that's that great. I, because just in case, okay, so right now, just because of the new year, I'm reading this book, um, Slow, Simple Living for a Frantic World. Um, I posted about it on my Instagram. And so I'm just loving this book. For me right now, I'm thinking about, and even if you have a book idea that's like practical ideas, right? Like I'm looking for what, how do you do the thing you're telling me to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, like books that have heart, because this book slow is part memoir, but it's also practical solutions and ideas for those of us who are looking for simpler living, slower living. Um, Rom-coms, I'm Emma St. Clair. This is next up for me. I've been wanting to read this for a while. Um, I love um, the idea that she has here for her books um, and she's closed door romance. And that's something that I'm interested in for the rom-coms. And then and also, this is a thick book, friends. <laughs> Yeah. But this, um, I'm focused on Agnes Gray down here. This is a Bronte Sisters volume, and I'm actually reading it for a book club that I'm in with author friends, Catherine Ray and Sarah Ladd, and it's called What the Dickens Book Club. So we read a classic book every month, and then we meet and we chat with you online, live in the book club. And uh, I just thought this volume was so pretty. Actually, we're having a giveaway on it. Um, but by the time you see this, you never know, you know, we could be outside of the, the giveaway, but we are reading Agnes Gray as well. And I'm actually listening to Agnes Gray on audio. And it's super fun to drive around town and have that British accent in my car everywhere <laughs> I go. Yeah, I just got done listening to Authentically Izzy by Pepper mm -hmm. Basham. Yes, and it was oh, so she's funny so good. The Appalachian with kind of the Scottish brogue. And so it was such fun as an audiobook. Um, have you read the Rexford and Sloan series? I have not. No, should I? They, Where's my uh, pen? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was taking notes on the books you were saying, but um, <laughs> I'm getting ready to read the sixth in that series. And they're great audiobooks because they're set in London um, in like the 1800s, but they're mysteries set with this couple. And she's a, um, oh, it's an artist, but the editorial cartoonist, essentially. And he's okay, this okay. Girl. And so they solve these murders and things like that. And it's so much fun. So much it fun. It sounds like it sounds like that show, Miss Scarlet and the Duke. 
Do, do you watch any yeah. of the PBS masterpiece shows? I, yeah, oh my I goodness. TV to write. So yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So if you get an opportunity, when you turn your next book in, if you get yeah. an opportunity, um, and if y'all are out there watching this comment, give us a comment. If you like that show, I love all creatures, great and small. I love Miss Scarlet and the Dukes. I've been watching some of those shows and it sounds like that because she is a Victorian era detective, private detective, oh, fun. a man's world. So it's, it's got almost this jack the ripper vibe with the whole yeah. victorian and some of the this the underbelly of a uh, london at that time but it's definitely got the romance with uh the duke his name is um inspector wellington and they call him the duke because of the duke of wellington and uh, so and they've got this yeah. this awesome like tension will they won't they will they won't they and they're solving all these murders and it's super clever and uh again it's just a, a really fun like you're talking about in that that book yeah. series it's just a really fun storyline to follow oh that's fine I wrote it down because I really enjoyed this series is by Andrea Penrose and it's just so fun and there's a romance and there's this family of um you know where she takes in a couple orphans and just really a, a fun it has all the different layers and elements to it so and it's nice because I don't write in England at that time period so I can read mm -hmm. those when I'm writing and it has not it's the voice isn't going to come over to my writing and so always right. fun. always fun yeah all right. Well, I told you this would go really, really fast. Oh, it wow. Did. It's gone. It's yeah. gone. <laughs> yeah. But I hope everyone has enjoyed meeting Christy. You've really gotten a sense for who she is as a person, an author. Those of you who may be looking for an agent, you now know more about her as an agent. And all of us as readers should be checking out the What's the Dickens book club because it's Christy, Catherine Ray, and Sarah Ladd. And they're on Instagram and just have so much fun. So I highly encourage it. And it's a great way to make sure that you're catching up on some of the classics that you might right. have heard of, but not actually read. My favorite month was, of course, Anne of Green Gables. So. <laughs> well, and you know, we are revisiting some books that we've read before. So we have gone all the way through Austin's classics and we are revisiting them. So I believe next month we will be reading Pride and Prejudice. So if you're oh, interested good. at all, I mean, I love the Bronte sisters and Jane Austen. So for me, it just feels like a win-win. You know, I go right from January to February and I just feel like I'm winning with these classic books that we keep reading. So That's yeah, awesome. we'd love for you to join us. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And it's thank always you just a joy and a pleasure to catch up with you. So thank you. Thank Christy. you. <laughs> Bye.